Xavier, I'd be rich if I had a dollar every time I heard someone say, man, I wish I knew 20 years ago what I know today about money. They need to be teaching about this stuff in school. Like the power of investing early. Compound interest. That alone would impact lives. Understanding and planning for taxes. Understanding the difference between both good debt and bad debt. Eric, what about all the stuff about money that business owners need to know? What kind of insurance should you be buying? The importance of contributing towards your retirement. They don't teach any of this stuff in school. Y'all sit back, get ready, because we are talking stuff about money they didn't teach you in school that you need to know. Hey friends, it is Eric here. Um, This is a throwback episode from the Building Us podcast show that I used to do with Dr. Matt Morris. And the reason I'm rerunning this one and Xavier and I wanted to rerun this one is because Xavier and I have been having this conversation about the importance of having a household CFO, that somebody in the household has to act as the chief financial officer and help make decisions that are going to help the household grow and build wealth. That's exactly what we talk about. Our guest is Dr. Sarah Falau. Um, You may know her from her work with The Millionaire Next Door. It's a very popular book. It's one of my favorite books. And she builds on the research that her her dad, Tom Stanley, did in uh, this idea of what do people need to do to grow and build wealth. One very important concept that we talked about is this idea of turning income into wealth, that big incomes don't necessarily lead to wealth. It's people's ability. It's the skill to convert income to wealth is what's important. So y'all listen in. I'd love to hear your thoughts. This week, we are talking about your money. And here's the reality, Matt, that without a higher than average income, it's very difficult for people to amass wealth, Hmm. Um, especially while working for other people. And the reality is that the majority of small businesses uh, don't succeed. The rate in 2016, according to the Bureau of Labor, um, said that in 2016, the failure rate among small businesses within five years was 50%. So only half of small businesses make it. You hear me talk a lot about financial security, um, financial freedom, and financial independence. These are all words that we hear. And the ability to build wealth is what gives us financial security, not the ability to earn money, but the ability to build wealth. Um, So it takes... Um, for, for someone to be able to transform income that they earn into wealth does take worth because mm. does take work because not everyone is making a ton of money. It takes discipline, especially when we start looking at uh, the ability to save discipline around saving and discipline around managing one's finances effectively. And this is exactly why I'm excited about our guest um, today, uh, Sarah Falau. Sarah, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Tell us, tell us a little bit about yourself. Who are you, and why are you? Uh, why do you have street cred to come talk about this topic today? Oh wow! I don't know if I've ever been given that um, given that a, a description to have street cred. Um, yeah, you know, uh, my background is in industrial psychology. I'm a um, I'm somebody that likes to study how people, how and why people do the things that they do. Um, and measure things like personality and attitudes and values. And uh, I couple that with the data and research that my father began back in the late um, late 70s, early 80s, looking at how individuals build wealth over time. And so, you know, together with kind of the psychology and, and understanding people's personality, along with sort of that market research side, um, you know, that I guess that's my street cred background. Um, and certainly, uh, again, my, my father wrote The Millionaire Next Door. Um, so a lot of what I do today stems from the research that he began, you know, many years ago. Yeah, funny story. So I read or I was not a big reader early in my career, but The Millionaire Next Door was, was constantly quoted um, to me. So mm. I felt like I read it. <laughs> and then in, in, Working with Matt and other therapists, I kind of felt like I needed a um, some type of assessment to start like assessing people financially, right? They have all like the the cool psychology stuff, all the the you know we did a show on the Enneagram last mm, year. Yep, it's like I, I felt like I needed some something to quantify uh, people's attitudes uh, towards different topics um, in in the financial world, and I was reading one of the uh, I was reading Michael Kitsey's. Um, he's a prolific 
thought leader in the in the financial industry. And I think that's when you had launched your uh, your company, Data Points, yep. which actually provided these assessments. So that's how you and I first connected three or four yep. years ago. Yeah, it's been a while now. Yep, absolutely. And then I was excited to learn that you're built on the research of the millionaire next door. Uh, but anyway, let's get let's get into our topic about uh, what people need to be doing to have mm-hmm. success in their finances. Obviously, the millionaire next door is studying habits of millionaires. I I like to, you know, when I talk about it, I, I usually talk, I kind of um, use millionaire and financially successful mm. kind of interchangeably. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, millionaire status may or may not be something that uh, financially successful people attain, especially depending on levels of income. But as I opened, people's ability or their their skill in transforming income to wealth is what it's all about. Mm-hmm. Um, talk a little bit about that idea of income and wealth. Yep. So, you know, again, a lot of us think, especially early on, right, when we first start working or something like that, that, um, you know, how much we take home every year is tells us how rich we are and how wealthy we are and how financially successful we are. But um, in reality, it's really how much of that income we can transform into wealth that we're saving and investing. And so, you know, again, what we found through the research, again, not only that my father conducted, but certainly that we do today at Data Points, is that those who are really um, successful financially have certain characteristics that that really let them, if you will, or or support them in transforming income into wealth. Um, and so we see that kind of like what you said. You know, we see that whether we're talking about individuals who you know, maybe you're making $200,000 a year plus, um, and they're, you know, building wealth quickly that way. Um, Or we're talking about those that are maybe in the emerging affluent or even mass affluent groups where no matter where you are, if you are kind of, again, being frugal, living below your means, um, ignoring what the people around you are doing, those folks tend to build wealth faster than those that, you know, maybe spend everything that they have. And you lay out in, uh, in one of the chapters in your book, The Next Millionaire Next Door, you lay out kind of a, a job description or a help wanted mm-hmm. ad for <laughs> the uh, what you what you call the household CFO, the household chief financial officer. And that's really what I want to get into today is what 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 do we need to be doing mm-hmm. in this next normal if we want to have uh, success financially? Obviously, coming off of Last year was a tough year. Some people did well. Um, A lot of people struggled. It's kind of a mixed bag. Um, But what are those things that uh, for anyone who wants to be successful, whether in the middle of a crisis, which we don't necessarily plan for, in the midst of uncertainty, or in the midst of of having um, things go our way and having success, what are those characteristics and and those traits that we need to do? So lay out for us, what is the household CFO and what are some of the roles that you see the household CFO needing to play? Yeah, that's that's a great question. So we really studied this job, if you will, using, again, going back to my industrial psychology days, we tried to dissect and understand everything that you have to do to manage your financial life. And if you sit down and start thinking about it, or you read that chapter, um, we even have an academic paper on, on this. So you can certainly go look that up. But Um, if you start to think about all the things that you have to do um, as the person that's responsible for finances, it can be really overwhelming. I mean, there's everything from, again, monitoring what's happening in your financial life, making investments, paying bills, um, you know, balancing checkbooks, looking at uh, or thinking about taxes and then doing something about them as well. Um, Also, there's relationship side pieces. So working with other people within your household, how do you explain what's going on in your financial life or or do you explain it? Um, You know, how do you work with the other people, especially, you know, again, a spouse or a significant other to make sure that you're on the same page? So there are a ton of tasks that are required to actually do this well. Um, But then you have to think, well, Again, if it's a lot of detail and a lot of, um, there's also this relational component, you know, how do I do this job well? What are the things or the skills that I need to do this job well? And that's that's really where we get into the psychology side, those things like, um, you know, being able to manage your emotions and, and spending time planning and monitoring and being frugal and all those things as well. Yeah. So 
a lot of tasks that you that you just laid out mm-hmm. and, I, and you know when I when I meet with clients and I know um, when when Matt and I have talked about this as he meets with clients and he's counseling maybe uh, couples that are struggling and these are some things that they might not be doing well they might not be accounting for their wealth properly they might not be sitting down and making um, a budget a monthly budget or sticking to some some predictable form of of spending. I don't know how many people actually sit down and spreadsheet mm-hmm. a budget, but certainly people follow predictable uh, patterns and habits of spending. And when you're not taking time to do that, no one's taking the lead in the house. And if you look at the household as a business, right? We, we obviously think of CFOs as, as business roles, mm-hmm. but in the household, if you know, we operate our household and no one is leading when it comes to money and doing those things that you laid out, it's going to put us in, in, in quite a predicament. So someone in the house has to be the household. How do you decide who's the household CFO? Mm. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. You know, we were, I was talking with um, a, a client of ours who uses our assessments too. And uh, they, you know, they were talking about a couple that had come in and one of the, I, I believe it was the the husband had always done the finances, everything about the financial, you know, side of their household. Um, but did not like it and was not, you know, maybe the most detail oriented. And and it was a real struggle for him to get those tasks done. Um, and the uh, the wife in this case never had done that job before, but she was um, more of the breadwinner and was out there, you know, generating the income and so forth. Um, but they kind of learned through just conversations that they recognized all of a sudden that that was sort of a um, a schema that they've used for their life, that, that, that he was going to do the finances and she was going to earn the money. And what they recognized just through a conversation, again, a conversation with someone like you guys would be, hey, you know, guess what? We don't have to do it this way. I actually like these things and I'm good at them. And I would love to take that off your plate. Maybe there's another way we can structure our household so that, you know, you can take something that I'm doing on and I'll take on this this task. So, again, it's as, it, it may be just as easy as having a conversation. Um, I think that the trouble comes in kind of like what you're saying, Eric, when um, a, a household, no, when no one is doing the job, right? Somebody has to do it. But, but when no one is doing it, that can be a tougher conversation. So maybe it's even splitting some of those pieces up um, and, you know, finding the things that you can do, or at least, you know, even if it's begrudgingly, you can do sort of well um, and, and splitting those tasks up too. That's interesting. And Matt, you might, you might appreciate this. I was meeting with um, a couple, a longtime client. Um, and this is early on in using your assessment, Sarah. And what's really mm-hmm. cool is I can take, I can take uh, one, one spouse's um, attitudes, right? Or their, their, yep. their, their characteristics and overlay it on the other spouses and kind of see where strengths and weakness. And it was fascinating to me because immediately, I was able to see where some of them, and they weren't having money conflict, but they were having problems making big decisions. And mm-hmm. part of the problem was she didn't have a good grasp of their overall financial picture just mm. because she didn't, it was just the roles that they fell into. He did the money and she she didn't. Um, so they fell into these traditional, I guess, traditional roles. And I laid out their results in front of them. And I basically told the husband, I said, hey, would you have a problem if she just sat down with you when you paid bills? Oh no, no, I got no problem at all. Like I've got no issue. So um, they came back a month later, and they had made two huge financial decisions. Um, just because she was now, she felt more confident, and I think that's one of the, the characteristics that mm-hmm. you look at is confidence. And she just had more confidence because she was able to see uh, not what was being hidden, just just what you know the way they their 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 habits had had been formed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I yeah, I work with couples regularly that have not figured out a household CFO or the the processes and procedures of of managing their money together. Um oftentimes they're they're choosing this role by default, almost like any mini miny mo or limbo or something some, something like that where where somebody just got appointed to be the CFO or part of the CFO and and so they're not really doing this um with a lot of intention oftentimes. Mm. And when, when we, when I ask them about how they develop those habits or processes or, or, um, uh, skills, 
um, they often don't have great answers for that. They, they're kind of falling back into either family of origin habits or habits that they developed um, as young adults and just kind of repeating that now as, as spouses and families. And so uh, that's, that seems like that's part of the problem. Number one, Sarah, that you're, you're pointing out is that running a house house's finances is really complex mm-hmm. and there's a lot of aspects to the job. And number two, we don't have a great, place in life to learn all of that stuff. Um, we, we, many people are not learning this in school anywhere along the way. They're not taking classes in this. They're, you, you can certainly go out and read books or listen to podcasts or go out and seek out the information and, and learn it yourself. Uh, maybe there's a master class these days on personal finances. I don't know. <laughs> um, but th- there's not a routine, regular way to learn the, this information. And so people really have to be uh, intentional about finding it out. So there's there's both aspects. It's really complex and we don't naturally know how to do it. Yeah, that that's a great point. I think that, you know, even when we look at um, individuals that have been, um, that have had parents that have even taught them about some of the basics. So maybe they saw their parents, you know, balancing the checkbook, like physically, when you had to actually write it out, that, that kind of thing. Um, even if they received that kind of training, some of those more complex pieces um, are even, you know, are difficult as well, right? So like the investing side, we find that only, I think it's about 18% of individuals that respond to our surveys indicate that their parents even discussed investments or taught them about investing. Um, And that could be for a variety of reasons, but you're you're right. If you don't have that exposure, you do have to seek it out yourself. Um, and and that's one of the, again, we, we know from our research that having some confidence, having some knowledge, taking the time to plan and monitor, those things predict wealth. They, they predict it from, mm. um, you know, uh, uh, without, you know, regards to your age or your income. So it is critical, even if you didn't have that experience, to, to somehow find, find it. Um, and it, you're right, it, there are resources out there, but it does require some intention. Mm-hmm. So... Now, let me just, I, I've got a signpost what you guys are saying. Y'all are saying something that I think is so important that most people don't fully appreciate is that your your income, your annual income is not a great predictor of financial success or wealth. That They're, they're connected, they're related. Annual income is certainly related to that. But uh, oftentimes we ask each other, how much do you make a year or what does that job pay per year or what's mm-hmm. your in what's your salary going to be and you guys are talking about taking your income and converting it to wealth as as being the real skill that somehow somehow getting that money that you earned at work and converting it to wealth as being the real the real skill of 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 like being financially successful yeah yeah i, I think Maybe another way to think about it is, you know, if you take, let's say there's three people you, that you work with, you're all making the same amount of money, you're roughly the same age. The people, you know, if, if you are, you know, really focused on financial success and you live below your means and you seek knowledge and you, you know, become confident in your investment decision making and, you know, you ignore what everybody else is driving, that, that kind of thing, you will build well faster than your peers. I mean, certainly age and income are related to, to net worth. That's, yeah. you know, but but now we're trying to find out, and again, our, our, our whole purpose at Data Points is to determine what are those things that go above and beyond your age or your income level? Like, what else can we do? Because a lot, you know, again, I can't help what age I am, even if I wanted to. Um, and a lot of us can't control how much money we make, but we can control and do something about some of those competencies. Yeah, we're we're gonna we're gonna jump into to some of that in a second. Something that's interesting, you're talking about what you can't control and what you can control. I think it's in your book um, where I think it was in 2017. The stat of of millionaires of of new mil- of people who were millionaires, like 86 percent were first generation millionaires, mm. which means that this is not you know wealth isn't you know wealthy people are it's not necessarily generational from one generation to the next. It's there's this idea that there's some upward mobility and there's some things that we can do and some skills that we can learn and get better at mm-hmm. to increase our chances of 
building uh, wealth and amassing wealth. Absolutely. And I think I, I think it's important to at this point to to also point out kind of the converse there, which is, you know, a lot of people think that, OK, you know, and again, generational wealth is something that that's there and there's, you know, it, it can be passed down. But the, the trick is what happens after it goes to that second and third generations or generation, I should say. Yeah. And what we know, again, through academic research and elsewhere, especially economic research, is that those in the third and fourth generations tend to squander that money. I mean, it has to start all over again. Again, it, you know, we'll leave out the people that are handing over billions of dollars to their to their heirs. That's that's a little higher than what we're talking about here. But, mm-hmm. um, you know, it is behavior. It's what we do with what we have, whether you've received it through, you know, your job or, you know, through an inheritance. How are you taking that? money and, and, and transforming it into wealth. So, you know, we kind of can see it both ways. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about not the specific tasks that we need to perform as household CFO, but how, what what are some things that we can do to help us perform those tasks as household CFO better to perform that role? Well, one of the first things that you talk about is check your emotions. Mm, How, How do emotions get in the way of us being bad CFOs? You know, I think that most of the time when we think about emotions related to money, um, at least in the media, it's talked about related to investing. But I think it can also play in when we're making big financial decisions, like you were describing your your couple that was making those two big decisions. Um, And I'm sure Matt knows more about this than I do being on on the side that he is. But when we're emotional, we're really bad. We're bad decision makers. I mean, we're we're not great decision makers a lot of the time anyway. But if you add to it emotion, um, that can really com- complicate things. And and think about, for example, if you've ever lost a loved one, especially one that was very close to you, let's say a spouse or, or a child um, or something like that. Um, that's probably one of the worst times to make large scale decisions. And so. Again, that's just an example. But if you are about to make some kind of large scale decision that could alter, maybe even like change jobs or maybe it's a car purchase or home purchase, um, you do have to check to see if you are in kind of the, the state that you need to be in in order to make that decision well. But I definitely would love to hear from Matt on that, too. Well, I, I'm thinking about all the different emotions that um mm that get people to make decisions Mm -hmm. and get people to make not the best decision. So there's the, the emotion of fear acting out of, um, some, some feeling of, uh, I've got, I've got to spin this to protect myself in some way, or, um, I've got to buy it right now or I'll lose the opportunity. I'm afraid of losing this great opportunity to buy this timeshare or whatever, you know, whatever that is. Um, so there's, there's the fear aspect. Um, but there's also the emotion of, of uh, love or attraction. I want them to be impressed with me. Mm. I want them to feel attracted to me. So I'm going to buy the bigger diamond or the bigger ring or something like that. Um, there is the emotion of, of not feeling great about oneself and wanting to pump oneself up. So buying a, a you know, a higher price car or a, a car with a certain emblem on it. Um, but there's about, also the, the the emotion of just excitement and and the feel the rush of buying something and the rush of, uh, you know, I see my my, um, I see my kids, uh, being enamored with something for a day or a week and really being excited about it and wanting to spend their money on it and I mean they they spend so much energy thinking about buying it, um, sometimes they get to buy it sometimes they don't but they're that that excitement emotion mm-hmm. so there are different kinds of emotions really propel us to make different kinds of decisions yeah i was thinking about this in context of over the holidays watching um national lampoon's christmas vacation mm. <laughs> right and clark uh, uh spends all this money in anticipation in, in the exuberance of the emotions yeah. of the holidays and the expectation of getting a right. bonus that he didn't get oh yep. yeah right so here he here his his poor financial decision was um was magnified by um by this emotion that that was kind of put in front of that decision i think that's what emotions do whether it's exuberance or fear or anxiety on the opposite side um it magnifies sometimes the 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 consequences of decisions yeah and i think you know going back to kind of those characteristics that allow us to build wealth so um and thinking about what you just said matt too 
um, you know, if we have confidence in our investment decision making or our, our general financial management in general, which requires some knowledge, which requires some experience, um, we're 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 let you know not as likely to make that neg- you know decision based on what others are doing and that kind of thing. Or if we're not. Um, if we can start becoming a little less concerned about what others think, maybe we don't need to buy the bigger engagement ring or the larger house or what have you. If we can kind of learn that that's, you know, ultimately going to keep us from achieving our financial goals, um, that that's one way to sort of curtail some of those kind of, like you said, elation uh, emotions or those that are uh, tied to, to self-confidence and things like that. That's a great segue into another uh, another one of these things that we can do to perform better is ignoring the herd mm-hmm. or uh, ignoring the Joneses. Matt and I actually did an episode on uh, on the Joneses on keeping up with the Joneses, but you're you're that's what you just said kind of captures that idea. And actually, one of my um, it's a couple quotes from your your book that um, that I absolutely love that deals with this. Uh, one is. But consuming today in anticipation of... I'm sorry, that's not the right one. Let me see. Um, Here we go. Uh, For those who make an average to above average income in the United States, the path to economic success necessitates a certain amount of restraint in consumption. It requires an awareness and inoculation from the consumerism and affluenza that plagues many households with significant income levels. And when we think about that, the consumerism and affluenza, it's seeing what everyone else has and wanting what everyone else has. Yeah. I mean, I think that the, the, you know, if you think about um, people that you know that end up buying uh, the same or similar car of, of other neighbors in your neighborhood, right. It's like, okay, they just bought this and then they bought it. And then they, you know, it, it kind of travels if you will. Um, Mm -hmm. And, you know, there are a lot of different reasons why we do that, but some of us are just more aware of what other people are doing. You know, that's just, that's kind of a a characteristic that some of us have. And if you couple that with, um, you know, kind of wanting to fit in, it's good to want to fit in. We we need to have community and people around us. Those those are generally good things. Um, But again, if it influences the way in which you buy, then that can take you off the path of, of financial success. And Again, I think a lot of us, and especially starting out when you've got, you know, just out of school, first job, that kind of thing, um, thinking that you need to buy the same things that someone that's a, you know, C-level executive that's, you know, that's worth five, ten million dollars, it's, 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 it's not your like you like you just quoted. Um, you're spending in anticipation of achieving that financial success, which you may never achieve. Hmm. Yeah, I feel like I, I've something I tell younger couples often or younger people often is don't try to accumulate in five years, everything your parents took 40 years mm, mm-hmm, to accumulate. Mm, it's like, I want yeah. it now. I need it now. And you, you talk about the, uh, uh, the arms race of gadgets and cars and accessories. Uh, and I love, I think in, in, in the context of the arms race, I love that. Yeah, I mean, you know, especially again, I, I talk about teenagers because I have them, but at the same time, this this is, you know, we all are suffering from this to some extent. Um, that you know, having the newest and latest and greatest in technology is something that you can post, for example. I mean, now we compare ourselves to not just the people that live next to us or the people we work with or our friends. Um, we can compare ourselves to everyone, you know, through social media. So it's it's even harder for those of us who like community, who you know want to fit in and that kind of thing, um, to be able to kind of push that aside in order to pursue our goals. That's yeah. interesting that that this you're talking about uh, social indifference about you know not paying attention to what all's going around you, but you're also in some way talking about social media indifference now, and that mm. we're not just looking around our neighborhood at at our neighbors who bought cars or whatever, but or our school and what kids are wearing at school, but we're looking at on social media at the whole world to some extent about what people are buying or not. And so uh, maybe there's even more pressure to spend. Uh, now and 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 as you know, some of the economic trends during the pandemic pointed out, some families had more disposable income. Not obviously, not everybody, but some people did, and that they weren't spending money 
on activities that they had been spending money on. They weren't going out as much. They weren't uh, going to concerts and football games and restaurants as much. And so they had more access to some disposable income and it got spent, a lot of it got spent on Amazon and, mm-hmm. and other, other places. Uh, in this next normal, um, as people may have access to a little bit more money, um, what are, what are you all recommending uh, people do to convert that freed up money to, to wealth at this point? It, it almost seems like the pandemic is giving people a chance to um, have a financial household meeting and say, mm-hmm. where do we want to spend our money now? That's a great segue to the next point that you talk about, allocate time to managing your finances. Mm. So Yeah. And, and I'll, I'll you know, kind of put that back to Eric because I'm certainly not a financial planner or a financial professional. So in terms of kind of recommendation there, I, I'd have to let him provide that. But, you know, again, what we do know, kind of like what you said, Matt, is that those that tend to be really great at amassing wealth over time spend time planning their financial life. So they're not just kind of let, leaving it up to chance or just, you know, um, pulling everything together when it's tax season. They're they're really taking time every month, every week uh, to plan and monitor what's happening in their financial life. And I think, again, going back to what we were saying at the beginning, um, that involves, especially if you're in a household with more than just you, that involves the whole team and and primarily, of course, your spouse or significant other. Um, but but having those kinds of meetings and deciding what to do, uh, you know, we would argue based on the data would, would probably be the best route. A base the bringing up the data about those two points about uh, spending time, um, at, you know, setting aside time to manage money mm-hmm. and amassing wealth from the data are those correlates or is that is is it a, is it a predictive variable? So what we know is that, for example, if you split, and that's where that concept of the prodigious accumulator of wealth and the under accumulator of wealth, essentially they're the same in terms of their income level, but one has you know, a net worth that's two and a half or three times as much as the under accumulator of wealth. So when we compare those two groups, we see that there's a significant difference in the number of hours that they spend, for example, planning their investments. So that's one kind of difference. But we also know from a, a, a correlational perspective, if you will, or um, w- when you look at, um, you know, again, income and age predict net worth, but what adds incrementally to that prediction is their scores on what we call planning and monitoring. So it's essentially a, um, a personality-based assessment of their planning and monitoring skills and behaviors and, and all of that. And what we know is that Uh, Those that end up spending more time or reporting that they spend more time doing those things tend to be more, uh, tend to have a higher net worth than those that don't. So that's a, that's a correlation there. Mm -hmm. Do you know, do you have the numbers, like how much more time the prodigious accumulators Mm -hmm. of wealth spend versus the, the, um, yeah. So in uh, in terms of, um, general financial planning, I don't, but, you know, we look at things like investment management primarily. So it's somewhere around 11 hours that the prodigious accumulators of wealth spend, um, a month. And it's somewhere around nine hours a month that the under accumulators of wealth spend were related to investments. Hmm. So kind of how we opened in this, how we opened the episode where some people just aren't doing these tasks. Mm-hmm. If you're spending time, uh, more time than you're, you know, presumably doing more of the tasks. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I'm going to get on it. I'm going (laughs) to set aside some more time. Wait till we're done, Matt. Wait till we're (laughs) done with the episode. Not yet. So we talked about checking your emotions. We've talked about ignoring the herd in the Joes in the Joneses. We've talked about taking the time to manage um, your finances. Um, I want to jump here to one that says, if needed, seek advice from fiduciaries, because y'all both kind of alluded to this, uh, Matt's question about what do people need to be doing? Mm-hmm. And then your, your comment about, well, ask, ask Eric, he's the planner. I'm not. <laughs> um, so if needed, seek advice from fiduciaries. Talk to us a little bit about, about that. Well, again, you know, n- not all of us, and I, I definitely am in this camp. I, I would be a terrible uh, financial planner, um, Eric, just so you know. I think I've shared that with you before, but I would not be great at that job. 
uh, for a lot of different reasons, but I really don't um, have the personality for it. We, we, um, we all can't be great at everything. Uh, that's right. That's okay. right. Yeah. Okay. You, you right. give me, you give, you give me the data. To right. Be good at what that's I do. right. There you oh, go. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm, yes. Um, but again, um, you know, if there are areas where you've decided, you know what, this is just something that's too much for us. We feel like we're running around in circles. Um, you know, we're, we're not getting, you know, we're not seeing the results we want to see. That's when there are, again, financial professionals that are out there that can act in your best interest, can help create a plan, and, and many of them even implement that plan. But um, there are different levels, I think, now, especially compared to when my father wrote um, The Millionaire Next Door, which was published in 96. Um, there are many more options for working with a professional to help you with your money, whether that's in the counseling set, set, setting or a therapy setting or, again, financial planners and things like that. So um, there's a whole host of resources and professionals that are out there that can help. Um, and, and sometimes that can even, especially with couples, bridge the gap between it when there are differences. So I have, like, for example, if you have a couple where, um, you know, one of the spouses really has the perspective that they want to live for today, they want to enjoy life, they want to make sure that they enjoy time with their kids and that they're doing as many activities as possible and going on vacation. And you have, you know, the, the spouse that really views all of that that needing to happen when they're in retirement. Like we need to save for the future. I, I'm scared, you know, about what's going to happen. You know, those may be issues that you together can't really reconcile. And so that's when it's great to have, again, someone that that works with couples or works um, in that field to help walk through those issues and try to find some resolution as well. And not only not only someone who works in the field. Because presumably they have a skill level that's above the average individual, but sometimes it's good just to have a, a second set of eyes or a third party um, provide counsel or advice to either confirm or affirm what you're already doing, or to steer you in a different direction. Yeah, that that's a great point too. Um, you know, certainly I think that again, going back to our point about how a lot of this isn't taught and we don't learn it, we learn it sort of piecemeal. Um, I, I think that that's at least for the advisors we work with, that tends to be a lot of of where their clients come from. In other words, they're starting out saying, "Hey, I just I just want someone to kind of take a look at this," and then they end up, you know, having a longer relationship too. Yeah. So, kind of in this idea of seeking advice from fiduciaries, I kind of think of it. Kind of in two in two spaces. One, I think, on the investment side, um, and then the second side, I think, of more on the financial planning side and mm-hmm. making financial decisions. Um, and when we look at the investment side, we have very interesting uh, data and very interesting statistics that that shows that individuals who work with fiduciaries or planners, most planners are going to be fiduciaries, meaning they're uh, required by by law to make um, recommendations that are in the best interest of um, the, the clients. And not all financial advisors are fiduciaries. That's something that's important to, to point out. There's a lot of data that shows that those clients who work with fiduciaries outperform in multiple areas in the investment space. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. So, so again, you know, and that's primarily due to their interaction with their behavior, right? So I'm, I'm that financial yep. professional is helping the client, um, or you know, I can use me as an example, right? So helping me make better decisions because I'm not, you know, when the market tanks, I'm not selling everything. Or hey, this might be a great time to invest when I maybe am feeling very anxious about being on the sideline, or just helping me stick to my plan. And I think that that's where that return comes from from working with a professional. In my holiday message to my um, to my clients last year, I, I congratulated them. I think I had only a handful of clients that we actually changed their investments due to um, them having a change in, in in objectives and a change in goals. But everyone else stayed the course. Uh, outside of the normal changes that we make in the portfolio, they stayed the course. And something that I that I say often is that um, the stock market will reward those people who stay invested. The challenge is as a as a um, as a planner as an investment guy is to put you in a portfolio that's going to encourage you to stay invested. Mm-hmm. A lot of people don't realize this, but the dominant factor in portfolio growth is, and you said it 
um, when, we, when we talked about this one point here, is managing saving and investing behaviors. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the first factor was check your emotions, uh, fiduciaries, advisors, even even in that space in couples counseling. Um, the, the the one of the values, the added value that advisors bring to the table is to help check those emotions mm-hmm. and keep those emotions out mm-hmm. of making those fast um, decisions. You know, and just as a history note, uh, what you guys are talking about, um, seeking advice from other experts or, or professionals or fiduciaries is really how Building Us got started. It was, uh, mm-hmm. I had so many couples clients that, um, you know, had, had kind of hit their limit or, or tapped out their own resources for managing their money and needed, needed the adver- advice of someone else. Um, and so, uh, was able to connect people with, with Eric and he was able to coach and, and support and advise, uh, many, many clients. And, and, uh, that's how all of this got started. Yeah. This kind of leads to the other point. And we have two more points here. These are, these will be quick and then we're going to wrap up. Um, is be disciplined in managing finances. You know, we talked about that a fiduciary and advisor can help you uh, stay disciplined, but I know that discipline and frugality are the two factors that um, are most closely tied to building wealth. Is is that a correct statement that you found? Yeah, you know, there's, you? there are six of them, but yeah, frugality for sure. Um, and, and discipline plays into not only frugality, but also that planning and monitoring piece. So if you have clients that, or, you know, if you are working with an advisor and they're talking about, you know, managing your behaviors or something like that. And that may sound cringeworthy, right? Like, why are you managing my behaviors? I don't want to talk about that. Um, You know, maybe there's some nuance there that they can try. But the the fact of the matter is the more disciplined we are when we have a plan, the better off we are. And, And you can think about that whether you're running a business or you're trying to save for college or you're trying to lose weight. Um, you know, if we're able to create a plan that makes sense, that maybe, again, has what, you know, that term stretch goals, but, but, but a goal that, that's meaningful to you and you're able to be disciplined in following the plan, um, you have a better chance of success. And so that's why discipline co- becomes so important. And it's often cited by um, the millionaires, again, whether we're talking about the millionaires from the 90s or those from, from today, as being a really important factor in their success. Yeah, and discipline is doesn't come easy. Like, and, and I, I, I would say that most people lack uh, sufficient self discipline mm. to do this on their own. So we have to look at other ways to remain disciplined by automating certain tasks that we deem important. Could be an automatic savings program. It could be if you work at a company with a four hundred one k, automatically deducting your four hundred one k contribution. Uh, it could be. You know, I'm terrible at paying bills on time, so it could be automating bill pay for right. for certain uh, certain bills. In the investment space, we look at automatic rebalancing of the portfolio to make sure that you're in the proper uh, risk tolerance. Uh, so, you know, looking for other ways to build discipline, um, create environments. I think we talked about this on the show about your habits. Is looking uh, disciplined or successful people are not necessarily more disciplined and unsuccessful people, they just have a tendency to build environments that are less likely um, to fail Mm. because of of structures that they've put in place. So you can be disciplined by automating. You can be disciplined by seeking accountability, maybe from someone else in the household, your spouse, or you can um, seek discipline by um, outsourcing some of these roles to a fiduciary, outsourcing Mm. the investment role to an advisor outsourcing accounting to an accountant. Yeah, I, I think that again, going back to the concept of a, of a household CFO, um, part of what you can do again, thinking about you know um, a, a new starter, the next normal, all of that is is thinking through, um, like you said, what what 
what are these tasks or what are the things that we have to do in order to manage our household effectively? What can we automate? What can we, you know, hand off to someone else? Um, and then what will I be responsible for? And what will you be responsible for? I think that um, by doing that, you'll number one, make sure nothing slips through the cracks. But then, like you said, you've got this discipline in place, even if it's something that's using technology, it's, it's a discipline. It's a great point. And I, I know that you have a hard stop here in, in a few minutes, but I want to hit, there's one more uh, factor, one more thing that we can do to perform well. And I'm going to introduce it and kind of let, let Matt uh, wrap us up here because I think that this is a, kind of in his, in his space. You say support your team and you talk about that you know, the CFO is, in managing finances is critical, but you also talk about it as, um, as a supporting role, as being a loving spouse or a caring parent or thoughtful caregiver. Talk a little bit about how being a good CFO plays into these other roles that that someone might play in the family. And I'd love to hear Matt's thoughts on it. And then I'll let him kind of wrap us up. Uh, I, I think it's so important that uh, families pull together financially, that they're pulling in the same direction financially, that they're working together, that they, they understand the plan. They have uh, processes that are shared um, and they're committed to, similar goals that every voice uh, matters in in the conversation and that they're they're feeling heard and they're fe- they're not they're feeling supported and they're not feeling undercut by each other's financial behaviors i think it's just mm-hmm. so important that uh, in all of the difficulty of of running a household's finances that nobody feels like uh, uh, s- somebody's passively passively aggressively um, uh, knocking the plan off track and that we're, we are open and honest about what we're doing financially and, and ultimately working toward the same destination. I think that's such an important Mm. aspect of, um, household finances, even if there's an elected CFO or an appointed CFO that all the other team members get it and are moving in the, in a similar direction. That's good. Sarah, final thoughts. Yeah, you know, I think that um, every time there's sort of a change in our lives, it's a great time to take stock of what we're doing and are there ways to improve. And and certainly, um, again, there's a lot of improvement for all of us in this role of household CFO. Um, and, and certainly it's a chance to think about how we're doing that job today and can we improve it? Because um, unfortunately, you know, we all have to manage our, our money to some extent, unless, again, unless we are, you know, we have $80 billion in the bank or something like that. But, um, and so this is, it's always a good time to, to check yourself and your household and see if you're um, performing that job well and if there's another way to do it. Yeah. I've told some clients before that they make enough money that they can afford to be sloppy and they can afford to mismanage their money just because. They, mm. they make that, but the majority of us do not, and the majority of us need to get better at these skills. Um, Sarah, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for yes. your work. I think it's noble work. I think um, anything in the money space, maybe I'm a bit biased, it's noble work because money does touch so many parts of our life. It impacts our relationships um, and uh, the, the information and the research that you're doing is fantastic. It's been helpful to me. It's been helpful to my clients. So I want to thank you again for your time and thank you for your work in helping us invest in our relationships. Well, thanks for having me. Information presented and discussed on the Stuff About Money podcast is for educational purposes only and does not constitute direct financial advice. Consult with a qualified financial advisor prior to implementing any strategies discussed. Eric Garcia and Xavier Angel's branch office is located in New Orleans, Louisiana. The branch phone number is 504-218-5479. Securities offered through Royal Alliance Associates Incorporated, member FINRA, SIPC. Advisory services offered through New Century Financial Group, LLC, a registered investment advisor not affiliated with Royal Alliance Associates Incorporated. 